want to welcome you to Sycamore Crossing. Oh no, this isn't Sycamore Crossing, is it? We're not at the Circuit s- World. You see the sunshine. I see the sunshine. And we're not far away. Yeah, we're it's not the, far away. Yeah, I think we will be over there before long. I want to tell you something funny. It was 75 degrees yesterday afternoon, and when I went out to my car yesterday morning, it was ice on the windshield. So we can go from 30, well, what, 28 degrees to 75 degrees in uh, 8, 10 hours up here in Blue Ridge this time of year. It's called being pas- pasteurized. Excuse, being pasteurized. excuse me, I hate to do this on live. Could you please sit up, sir? I'm trying to. I, I don't mean to do to that to I'm you on live distancing. TV. I'm social distancing. I mean, I have to tell you, set up straight. All right, now we're going to take the show away from you today. The, the, what are these on my thing here? Shotgun Sh- shells. Yeah, shotgun All right. shells. I am in disagreement. <clears throat> With um, with the constitutional carry law in the state of Georgia. Now I hate to tell you why I am. You know I have, I have a gun. I am for for concealed carry. I believe that when you go to get your learner's permit to drive a car, you have to take a written test about the. The rules. Um, the rules. And then your daddy takes a year, or your mama, excuse me, I shouldn't be sexist, someone takes a year to teach you to drive, and that year you're a learner. And then when you go to get your real license, you have to parallel park and stop on a line and go in and out of cones and demonstrate facility with the automobile. Okay. When you have... Now, I have something to say on this, so I'm listening. I know. When, I'm, I, no, I figured you would. So <laughs> when you have a open, you can go get a car and drive it without a license and without taking a test and not maybe having facility with it, I believe you're opening up the possibility that more of these six- and eight-year-old kids are going to find a gun in their home because these people have not been trained in how to keep their guns under lock and key when their children are around and properly uh, I wonder, champion them. I wonder, I've said before that when I was a boy, my dad was in the FBI, and every Saturday he would, on the picnic table in the yard, he would shine his shoes for church on Sunday and clean his two guns. And he taught all the neighborhood kids about gun safety. So you couldn't take a stick and go bang around my dad without him popping you. You don't punch your finger, a stick, or a cap gun at somebody because that could be, could a, be a bad, 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 learned bad behavior. learning habit. So anyway, so that's the only thing I'm going to disagree with about what they're doing down there this time. Now, now we're old. A politi- we're it's, old. A, it's also a health thing. There. We're old, Bill. Yes. When you were getting Hell a driver's, you, you had to get a driver's license to drive. I did. I wonder when in our country that started happening. About the 1926 to 28. Right. So, here's... So, no, right, let me finish this line of question. All right. So, line, he has a lot of questions. Society said there are too many accidents. People need to learn something. So, you're... I mean, I'm following your logic. It makes perfect sense. Look, if guns are going to be readily accessible, like cars are, you have to demonstrate you, are, you understand the safety... That's right. ...and protection of Some it. Kind That's of all way. we're all... It's all we're demanding. That's right, yeah. So, so you will... So you can, so what you're saying is, hey, you just can't go to any old store and pick up something that's deadly without demonstrating that you understand and are knowledgeable about protecting yeah. yourself and that's others. So now do I? Yeah. Do, now you. Okay. Well, so. You, I've, all right. I, 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 wait. 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 wait yeah. Yeah. But. I but. My program. Going well, I don't. Can I? Can I get something in? Yes, we'll all right. Thank you. All right. Let me tell you. Let me tell you where I, I see a difference. What you described was a privilege. No, stay with me. You described a privilege. A license is a privilege. A privilege could be taken away. You get the privilege of sharing the road with everybody. If you violate that, we have laws in place to take the privilege away. I see where you're going with this, but it's not quite right. Oh, well, you cut saying, me off. Did I cut you off? Yeah. I'm Did not. I cut you off? Okay. The first question. Wait, wait, wait a minute. No, let me finish this thought for you. Okay. He, he has the right to own the gun. He's talking about the right to bear and carry it around. Okay. But what, wait, but, but what you did is you, but she, he associated a privilege with a right. Yeah. A constitutional carrier. Out of no, it's a, it's, a, it's a right. There's a difference when we discuss a right. And if it's not a privilege. I understand. Okay, so when you license it, 
when there's you license it, then you then a license could be revoked. Okay, and you can have the door opened that the people good, out there, good nuance. Let's the, get pe the people out there, can revoke your license. Imagine. Can you imagine that here in a medically health program? Where he's going to get people guns that are going to kill all these little children in their bedrooms. Just you're the one that wore a shotgun tie, <laughs> and you're the one that oh, started this. Oh, I also this. wore these socks that Dr. Tibbins' oh. wife gave me because I thought he might not make it this morning. All right, you ready? I love these guys. I really do. <laughs> we don't want it to get too political here. All right. My father is a very healthy 55-year-old man who had not seen a doctor since college. Now that right there is an indictment. <clears throat> and was diagnosed with widespread colon cancer three years ago. Well, interestingly, he's obviously still alive because she's asking this question. F stage four colon cancer, remember a few months mm -hmm. ago, we said we have a life expectancy of, of uh, six to 24 months. And I said, well, we're changing that with some of our therapies. All right. He had almost a blockage of the colon and big masses in the liver, lung, and was blown up like pregnancy. So that meant mm. he had abdominal carcinomatosis. Oh, so you've got two hits on him now. Sorry, daughter. Okay. No health care till 55. Yeah. And was nearly dead. Dead, nearly dead. When he finally got diagnosed. That's correct. Okay. He responded to Fox Avastin drugs. That's, that's full Fox. He's pretty good. She can remember at least that much of it and the platinum drug, that was the oxaloplatin, and they stopped that drug after five months. Well, I usually have to stop it after six because your fingers get numb. They stopped it after five because he was in a remission. So that means that his belly went away and the things got smaller, he's doing fine. He still feels great, but has had a minimal increase in the liver spot. So that means they, signed, they, buy, they uh, did a scan and they biopsied it to send off for more gene testing. So what that means, oh, more. That means he had it once before. They didn't, she hadn't mentioned that yet. His original tumor had no actionable mutation. So that meant that it went to Foundation One or Karis or one of those. They tested it for 100 genes, and there were no genes there that directed you to a specific targeted therapy, which we've spoken mm -hmm. of here many times. So now he's progressing a little bit, but he feels absolutely good, all right? So we know we had a guy who's next to dead who feels good three years later. The oncologist said there are standard of care treatments that he should change to. So the question is now, he still feels great. All of his tumors are gone except so minor X -ray, progression. No x-ray changes, yeah. Minor right. progression. So he's not sick. He hasn't had any change. It's a, it's a test. Now, I usually say we don't treat a test. We treat a human being, right? So under the kind of the things I've historically said, you'd say, well, I'd continue doing this because he's not sick. That's not going to be my advice, I can tell you, okay? And I do want to really point out strongly that you're not being a Dr. F. Yeah, okay. right. Okay. You're actually watching your patient. You're seeing how they respond, yeah. and you're treating accordingly. Yes, and okay. to, 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 and changing to, your to treatment getting, to getting as better or getting yeah, worse. Right. Correct. Okay. All right. So he says there something might come of the gene testing, but there are no experimental protocols open for him now. So they've looked to see if there's anything that's that's out there. He also say if the protocols open up. He would be eligible if he fails the standard of care. Now, you remember I used to give that analogy of, of the, the guy going out in bow season the week before the deer season opens, and he's only got a certain number of, of, of arrows in his quiver, and he doesn't shoot some skinny little doe with all of his arrows first thing in the morning. He saves a couple in case a buck comes by. So you want to keep something in your armamentarium to use if this therapy doesn't work anymore. One of his patients yesterday has got diabetes and his blood sugar's going up and said, well, if it doesn't go down, Dr. Tedman's going to make me take shots. I heard that yesterday afternoon. You know, it's the next step in diabetes care. All right. So he says if protocols open up, he could be eligible if he fails the standard of care. What do you think of this approach? Well, obviously, I <laughs> the oncologist is on top of it, Ray's already said. I think that's a very good approach. But what I decided to do was take, take this and speak a little bit about how this guy's been managed and really why he's really done so well 
and sort of what the what what you see when you are treating somebody who's got metastatic disease and multiple organs but your liver has called a liver for one reason what you ain't got one you're not alive so let's let's go show that first one so this patient was diagnosed at the outset this is a much bigger thing on the tv over here and this colon cancer down here has gotten into his bloodstream it has to be in the bloodstream to have gone from the colon to the liver and the liver to the lung. All right, so that's what we call metastatic disease at the outset. Pull that one down. So let's go. The liver, you got it up there? I frequently say that in the Bible it says you spread your seed on barren soil. It won't grow on good soil. You get a great crop by the side of the road. It germinates comes up and is choked out by the weeds, that implies a characteristic to soil that makes it better or worse for letting that seed grow. Well, the seeds that the, the soil that's the best for colon cancer specifically to grow in is the liver because the colon sits right underneath the liver, right? When you eat something... And they share a bloodstream and a uh, venous collection. Yeah, yeah well, mm -hmm. right. When you eat, you know, you mm -hmm. that, that pork chop goes right through the, liver, the liver first. So right. this is where this blood goes. Well, it was also in his lung. Now, so, so when you there, look Bill, at... you made that point above his lung. I want to just make, put a little check mark on this. It's above and below the diaphragm. That's correct. And oncologists pay attention to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not locally spread. Yeah, it's this is spread through spread. the blood, and it's above and below the diaphragm. Yeah, and plus he was blown up like right. a balloon, right. she said. So right. that means that it was also outside of there in the abdominal cavity. So yeah. what's that thing right there? What you got there at BKP? A huge algorithm. <laughs> yes, it's can huge. Can you see that thing? I can say. All I right. was getting ready to say, wow. Okay. Got, okay, the purpose of this is it's a huge algorithm. Yes, it is. But as you go through here, all of the little blocks in there are for different drivers and genetic mutations. Okay. To say, when that guy first appeared, which direction are we going to go? All right? But the very first thing at the top says, if this patient is fit, you go in this direction. This says, if he's unable to tolerate intensive therapy has a poor performance status or extensive comorbidities. So remember now, we're always saying, just like, just like uh, COVID, you don't, you know, if you got diabetes, heart disease, you're overweight and you're, and you're 80, you have a bunch of comorbidities. If you're 48 years old and in good health with high cholesterol, you don't. Well, so that, so put up that next one. This is really one of the things we don't talk about much. How, read, read, read the headline now. Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group Performance Status. Performance Status, okay. So when it said poor performance status there, I'll just oh, show it's you. It's like an eye chart. <laughs> All right. Zero says fully active, no performance restrictions. Okay, that's us today. Right. Number one, strenuous physical activity is restricted fully ambulatory and able to carry out light work. Well, I don't know how strenuous we can get, but for our age, we're fine. No, we can't do what he can do, so we're, that, so we're still zero. But if you are sick enough to where you're up and about, but you're anemic enough to where you can't quite do what you did before, that's a one. Now listen to number two. Capable of all self-care, but unable to carry out any work activities, and up and about about 50 greater than 50 percent of waking hours so that's a lot of elderly people at that point at that point well you can't begin somebody that's any sicker than that any sicker than those three and preferably zero to one on chemotherapy with oxaliplatin and big time stuff so that's what that, that New, just, nuance that what you're saying there the, these are uh levels of condition of the patient presenting to you right these are not your instructions of what the patient can and cannot do in their life no no this is where they are in their life and that's right and you okay. take that by history right all right now what's that big old liver right yeah all right well yeah the reason i put this liver up there because it's got metastases these are all these little white things on that side over there are metastases but you'll remember i've said that you can take six sevenths of the liver out 
and that other one-seventh will, like a salamander's tail, take over function. Well, you notice, I hate to do it to you in, in, um, in uh, Roman numerals, but the liver, as I said before, is divided into different sections. And so this huge section over here, you can see there's plenty of left, and you see there's a little cleft right there. You can pull that down now. So the patient we had about a month ago, you'll remember, we had the liver resected. He began with a tumor in his colon and in the liver, but nowhere else. He got this chemo up for six months, and then they resected half of his liver and took out the primary tumor, which was still there, at, a, at two, two stage surgeries, he's totally free of disease. Well, that won't work for this guy because he's also got it in his lung and he has multiple spots. But anyway, that's to go back over what we said about the liver. So this next thing here, this is six different pictures from prior to treatment all the way through treatment. And it shows this big mass within the liver, which is in the very first one prior to treatment as it evolves over time, that's what happened to him. Pull that down now. So that's what happened to this guy in the first six months of treatment. Well, let, 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 you, we'll just look at this again. Let's pull it off the screen. But so this thing went all the way down to nothing, and then we don't have a picture that shows it is small, but it is. It's going to be smaller than a little, than a well, half the size of a grape, like big as a raisin in there. If it's just big enough for them to show small increase, so. All that's down now. So you can ask, ask again, what is my advice? My advice is, one, he did not have to have his liver resected. He didn't have to have his primary tumor removed. He was blown up like a balloon and in big time pain. He's now got normal performance status. I would do exactly what the oncologist said and the oncologist had enough sense to biopsy the liver and to send it out for more gene testing, and it is entirely likely, not sure, but it's entirely likely, that he may have a genetic driver when those gene tests come back. That's gonna be a month or longer, but the standard of care makes good sense. And I would therefore go to the standard of care because a second level of treatment for colorectal cancer is extremely effective, and you really don't feel like you've used all your your, uh, your arrows until you've gone through more lines of, tr of treatment. So I would follow the instructions there. All right, well, can, I do, can, can I do the um, family medicine aspect of this? Can I, can, can I? You can ask a uh, question, that's it. No, I wanna say something and I think you're gonna take what I say and, <laughs> and do exactly what you want there. Anyway, let me say this, okay? Now, when, when I'm solving I'm something, I'm going to. Okay. We're actually not done with the question. Oh, I do that when we're done with the question. It's my question, my, my program. Oh my gosh, I don't know what's up with these two today. But <laughs> let me say this, okay? Ser seriously, um, I, want, I want to take this serious for a minute. Okay, um, you know, when we're solving something, I will always tell the staff or whatever I'm working on, you could tell me all day long what happened to get here. This is where we're here right now. This is what we're dealing with. This is what we got to solve. So I, I don't want this to come across as, as, as the, I'm going to say this to somebody that's not been diagnosed. I'm very sorry for this situation. But I'm going to say it this way. This is what I don't like in the beginning of this question because I've been doing this for years with these gentlemen. And I'm just going to say 55. I may know something about that. And <laughs> you and I spend a lot of time, like if he's gone, we spend a lot of time it's not like a rerun, but we do always more or less beg men to go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. And we talk about women are used to going to the doctor at a young age from mm -hmm. menstrual cycles all the way through. Mm -hmm. So they're used to that relationship. Now, and I'll get out of the way. Here's something I don't like on this question. My father's a very healthy 55-year-old man. How do you know you're healthy if you haven't gone to the doctor? You can't determine that yourself. You can get up every day and feel good and think you feel good and say, I'm healthy. I'm very sorry to say, without going to the doctor, that's, that's not our determination. We can't personally determine we're healthy. And I'm not, I'm not coming down on anybody, but I'm just saying that. There's a difference between how you feel be, and right. how you might 
B. But we That's get a question. We get questions all the time, and I'm really not. We get questions all the time, and they start out like this. Uh, my dad's very healthy. My, my, you know, all right, so here, a very healthy 55-year-old man had not seen a doctor since college. I'm going to ask you guys, go to the doctor. You don't know you're healthy. You think you're healthy. I'm saying this personally from me, okay? You think you're healthy. Go to the doctor. Let the doctor do these tests so you're not in the situation and it's not too late or too far or whatever. Let a doctor determine you're healthy. Please go to the doctor. Now, I hope well, I didn't say, did I say that. too much? No, or? no, but I'll nuance it that a little bit, a little bit differently. When I was a you kid, come across I, a little nicer than I no, did. No, no, you came across really nice. Okay. Um, <laughs> when I when I was a young kid, there was a movie called Jeremiah Johnson, and I think every young boy like, man, I'm, I'm going to be one of those people. Those people don't exist. Okay. This uh, notion that, that you go out and live in the woods by yourself forever and that's life is a pa pathological state that really is kind of romantic, nice movie-like thing, but it doesn't exist. You don't survive. You don't survive. We survive by being social, related, connected people. This fella managed to ha have a family, stoically, I use that word stoically, put up with unimaginable amounts of discomfort to get to where he was yeah, before, before he, was he got to the doctor. That's right. So he's into an amazing level of self-denial and, 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 and minimization of his condition. That's your point. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I can make a point all day long to listen to us and go, get, go see your doctor. What I want to make the point of here is that you're in a family. You have a child or a daughter or, or a friend that you trust, and you run things by them. You say, you know what? My stomach's getting bigger, and I'm letting my belt out. Is that a problem? Right? Oh. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you, so be connected Just to people about that, that you trust. No, I'm talking about, you know, I'm talking about I this fellow, know, this I fellow has serious symptoms. I understand stuff. what you're saying. I understand. And, and now I would look back and ask that, uh, Bill, you said daughter. I didn't, I, I assumed it was a son. I don't, maybe it's in the question there, who, what, what child it was. But some child has now said, Dad. We're not doing this anymore. Yeah, that's right. Right? Yeah. We're we're paying attention. Right. Right. Yeah. And and so so that connection is now made. So let, let's try to make it a little bit earlier. This to, I I tell my when my fam, my patients come in, hopefully they come in with family. I will say to them, okay, so husband's here, wife's here, and she's saying I'm worried about getting Alzheimer's. I'll immediately turn to the husband and I'll say, well, if she's going to get Alzheimer's, she's not going to know it. If you know you're losing your memory, you don't have Alzheimer's. Right. She's not going to know it. What are you going to do? And then I'll look at her and I say, do you give him permission to do that? What I want him to do is bring her in. You know what? She keeps messing up in the kitchen. Or she's constantly looking for a purse now. Or you know what? She called me from the store and she didn't know what she was there for. Okay. Uh -oh. So, <laughs> but I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm I serious. Understand. It's an external reference. She's concerned. Well, mom had Alzheimer's. I'm at the age where mom had Alzheimer's. I don't have, think I have any symptoms right now. And I'm like, well, you're not going to have symptoms. You're not going to know your symptoms. He's going to know them. So I want you to give each other permission to talk about this to each other and listen. So there's so many parts of medicine in family care and stuff where you are now assigning people roles in the family. And I'm not saying every family controls every member of the family. I'm not a communist or a socialist or Dr. F, okay? I'm going to call him that a lot. But, um, but uh, you know, it is good to have those healthy relationships within the family and say, I'm kind, you know, I'm, I'm kind of your buddy on this. You know, we go swimming together as buddies. Uh, when, when you go swimming, I go swimming. We're going to pay attention together on this. And that's good. It's a good thing. That might get you into the doctor a little earlier. I yeah. One other thing, I, I hate to get, <laughs> we have another question here, but, you know, when you're talking about being 55 years old and not having seen a doctor, I guarantee you that somewhere between 40 and 45, he got to where he had to do this to read his watch and he went to the store and he got him some cheaters and wore the cheaters and that corrected his vision. So I'm just gonna use vision. You People ought to go see an eye care doctor sometime in their 20s, sometime in their 30s, but when you get to you know, get anywhere close to 50, you ought to go every several years. Now, that doesn't mean you got to go see an ophthalmologist and pay $1,000. You can go over to Walmart 
or Costco or somewhere where they've got an optometrist in there and just get the basic quick down and dirty. That's a pressure test, a retinal look and everything else. And that's not near as important as a colonoscopy yeah. or a mammogram, but still every, people just don't think about that. Well, let me ask you a question. You're in your 50s and you say, you know, my vision's getting a little blurry. Well, is your vision getting a little blurry or maybe you have, maybe you're a diabetic? Yeah, or you got cataracts or glaucoma. You understand. Or you understand. I understand. Well, 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 my point. My point is, is, and and I'm not going to go over this. And I, I really, I'm, I'm being sincere. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to come. Across, but when I see a very healthy 55 year old man, because I associate with that, uh, I wear glasses. Is my was my vision? I never wore glasses before. My vision getting blurry, or maybe am I in my. I, but I might just go around and say, ah, my vision's getting blurry, but I'm a healthy... No, 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 you don't know if you're... That's right. So uh, I'm not... Hey, right. before, yeah, you, you before you tell yeah. us who our sponsor is, the, the point is is that can, can you uh, identify someone in your family or in your realm, your best friend or whomever, that, that you run things by? Just run it by them. Dude, go to the doctor. Maybe the guy <laughs> you ride to work with. Yeah. Maybe. George... Georgia Cancer Specialists affiliated with Northside Hospital Cancer Institute. We appreciate you very much for sponsoring, and I really think this is the kind of discussion you want us to have. I really now, do. Now, this is a very interesting question because it's it, it, it uncovers a it uncovers a condition that has that, that's not cancer and oncologic, but has a very small link that's important to cancer and I'm all, I'm going to explain it in a second. My father just turned 85 years old. 12 years ago, he had angioneurotic edema and was found to have stage 0 chronic lymphocytic leukemia. The allergist asked his oncologist to treat him at that time to see if it would help the angioneurotic edema. Now, yet that's a little bit complicated. He did so without enthusiasm, and neither the angio or the CLL has returned. He is, now has totally normal blood counts, but 4 to 10% cells, that means cancer cells in his blood or leukemia cells in his blood, and he also has prostate cancer being observed without progression. Well, so does Dr. Whaley. The hematologist says, continue observation. What are your thoughts? Well, obviously my thoughts are to continue observation. So that basically answers the question. But what I figured I'd do is, is say a little bit about angioneurotic edema. Now, here we go. Guy comes into Ray's office and says, and on his questionnaire it says, do you have any drug allergies? And they put down morphine, codeine, uh, morphine, codeine, penicillin, ciprofloxacin, Everybody's penicillin. Yeah. and penicillin. Yeah. Well, when he takes the history, the morphine and the codeine is just nausea. That's not a that's not effect. an allergy. Yeah. Side effects, okay. The cipro turned out to be that he got myalgia, so that he's not going to use it in again again. But that's not an allergy. But the guy had an anaphylactic reaction to penicillin. He got short of breath and hives and everything. So that's a you'll die if you take that again. All right. So that is a true allergic reaction. So now we're going to this this angioedema is in the ballpark of anaphylaxis. So put the first one up here. So this is the causes of anaphylaxis. I have resuscitated, not in my office, two people with anaphylactic reactions who were dying. One lived across the street from me when I was uh, first year in practice, and she was hanging out her window of the house across the street talking to somebody in the street when she was stung in the lip by a yellow jacket. It was in the spring. And I was jogging, and she fell into the into the window. We ran in the house. She, that was an angel that had you there at that uh, moment. Angel had me there at the moment, and I was across the street from my house and hollered to my wife, who brought over my bag, and I had an epipen in my bag. You want to know what's more terrifying? Okay. So anyway, having your two-year-old child get stung by a bee and go into anaphylaxis. Yeah. Well, that's. I went, so I anyway, did that. if you look if you look at this here. 
stinging insects, you always think about that. But you remember when you get on the airplane and they'll say, peanuts may be used on the airplane. Peanut allergies are not a joke. So that, you can pull that down now. But that's, it is things that like rubber gloves and uh, various antibiotics. So that when you talk about anaphylaxis, you're usually talking about a stimulus, bee sting or something. This guy did not have that. This guy had angioneurotic edema and chronic lymphocytic leukemia and the allergist goes to the oncologist to ask the CLL to be treated. So that means that she has already tested him for allergies from everything to A to Z, all right? So put up this first one here. This, this is kind of the, you know, most people think about angioedema as a little face. So pull the next one down because when you go into well, this angioedema as a characteristic, generally you think about the rash but what is also going on is going on and can go on in the bowel and elsewhere in the GI tract you get nauseated and you get all sorts of systemic symptoms put up the next one now here this patient just walked into Ray's office you see that face oh wow now that'll get your attention that gets your attention now your staff's going to pull you out of whatever room you're in and they're going to take you into this room it, they're going to take you into this <laughs> room now you're going to immediately okay that 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 people got enough shot pull that thing down ray is going to know this algorithm here in his head okay he's really not because he's going to have to go well, the first thing to do is said have you been stung by a bee taking a penicillin pill you got anything new any have you had any new medicine in the last couple of days no did you eat any strawberries or tomatoes or something that you might not have eaten anything before? Say no. Have you started any new blood pressure medicine? Have you like had an antibiotic? And he starts going through that list. They say no, no, and no. All right. Well, it, we. So he starts filtering through the medication. He's right, what did he, you well, start? he's right here. Right. He's doing. He's doing the algorithm right. out of his head. Well, what's that first one say right there? Can you read it? Hereditary. Hereditary forms. forms yes. Ah, but see that. that that, but you, you, that's not in his. That's not in his head, because ninety-five percent of these you see walk in your office are all acquired, environmental, yeah. to, acquired to something else. Well, so this means that this this um, allergist has already gone through this whole thing here. One of the real common drugs are ACE inhibitors, blood pressure drugs, a penicillin, and then. F foods and I think strawberries and tomatoes are two of the ones that people get all the time and obviously peanuts now I've never I've never had a patient with a peanut allergy but people have died on airplanes because they opened up a pack of peanuts three rows in front of them and there ain't no more peanuts on airplanes for that reason well, when you get over here to the head hereditary forms there's one right here called deficiency of the C1 inhibitor molecule. Now that ain't any, <laughs> that's, that's rare, not part of your, hens team. that's not part of your primary care, <laughs> but you gotta go that, looking far and wide to find that one. Yeah, but that is associated, th th this particular patient I'm sure had that because chronic lymphocytic leukemia, even if it's a smoldering thing that doesn't need to be treated, can be associated with that one finding. All right, so that allergist was really, really sharp. Okay, put up the next one. Here. So, by th there, there are different mechanisms for these things. We had, we first just looked over there at what are the precipitating pills or or insects or stuff. But the mechanisms are that there's some cells in the body called mast cells. There's there's chemicals called bradykinin, and so when you get to the functional. Not, not the precipitator, but what's the mechanism? You can pull that down now. This becomes extremely complicated. Now, it's not the least bit complicated in the primary care doctor's office if the guy says, you know, I had strawberries last night and I haven't had them in a month of Sundays. First thing he's going to do, by the way, is he's going to give the guy some Benadryl and some steroids in the office. He's probably not going to hit him with an EpiPen unless it's in his breathing thing. He's going to do that before he takes it. If he's <laughs> wheezing, he's getting an yeah, EpiPen. If he, Otherwise, if he's, he's getting steroids. If, if, he's wheezing, if he's wheezing, he's going to get the EpiPen. All right, <laughs> pull, we'll pull this next one down. Because the, the, the interesting thing is you got two big old columns here, right? The allergic one and the non-allergic one. When you go the, to the ACE inhibitors, which is the drugs, 
and you get all the rest of this stuff, it, 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 then it's, you know, this one's more in the eyelids and this is more in the tongue. But if you look, the, the clinical picture is the same. But in this whole group over here, these don't respond to epinephrine, antihistamines, or steroids. And everything in that column responds to epinephrine, antihistamines, and steroids. Pull it down. So the two mechanisms are different. And in the office, you, you don't know what the mechanism is. So it's all, his, his job then is all in taking that very important history. First of all, he's got to give him stuff to make his face come down. But after he's taken that history, if he gets to the point where I ain't got it figured out, he doesn't stop there. That patient's going to see an allergist mm -hmm. because you don't want the next time this happens, the guy to be hiking up in the mountains up here and it turned out to be something... 20,000 feet up on an airplane. Yeah, right. right, and then boom, he's going to be a dead man. So basically, here's what happened with this guy, because he, his, his CLL obviously was did not need treating, because the doctor did it, what was the word she used, reluctantly. But the angioedema went away, the CLL went away, and it hadn't come back for 12 years. Now... When I guess a recent flow, he's had a 4% and a 10% on the flow, His blood counts are normal and he's fine. Does that mean he needs to be treated? No, he's still in the observation CLL, as long as the angio doesn't come back. And then, just like me and everybody else, he might be one of your other good friends just was diagnosed this week with state with uh, Gleason 6 prostate cancer and one biopsy is going to be treated with observation. And this guy's 85 years old. He also has prostate cancer being observed without progression. Hematologist says, continue observation. What are your thoughts, Ray? Continue observation, right? I mean, he's not sick. So don't worry about the white cells. His angio hadn't come back. That's more, that's the most serious manifestation here and let the doctors continue to follow him. There. All right. Like take that? home messages. Yes. Do you need to acknowledge our sponsor again? Well, I'm going to right now. Thank you, Georgia Cancer Specialist, <laughs> Northside Hospital Cancer Institute. Thank you for our questions and sponsoring our questions. And we did use up a lot of our time on the first question, and that was me. That's and okay. that was me. But well, that first question, no, I thought I, I think if we come up on something we need to talk about, we talk about it, and that's what I like here. So. Um, Primary care aspect of this question before we move into the, the right. tailing stuff. Um, it, if you've been diagnosed with an allergy that's catastrophic, you, know, yeah. you put aside the big words. Big time. You've been prescribed, hopefully, an EpiPen. That's part of your, it needs to be in your environment. Okay. Unfortunately, those things are like have a, a year, half, half life. That means they're, they're bad in a year. Look at the time. Look at the date on it. Make sure you're not walking around with a three-year-old EpiPen. And number two, those things don't do well in cars. Nothing, actually nothing does well in a hot car. So don't, don't keep your EpiPen in a car and uh, make sure it's up to date. Well, if you get the now tracks on because your husband's taking too much dope, I don't think you're supposed to leave that in your car yeah. either. We yeah. talked about that a few weeks ago. All right, so. Here's, here's, here's the news of the week. I just, I wanted to get this out of here because this is so interesting that it isn't COVID. It isn't COVID. Now, you remember last week, week before that, I mentioned that you, you don't want to buy stuff. You, you don't want to go to a health food store and buy anything. But most of that stuff's made in China. You don't know what's in it. And if, if you go to a, to a G, GNC or you go to one of these local pharmacies and on the bottle of vitamins you're buying or whatever, it says USP, that means U.S. Pharmacopeia, and it at least means it's manufactured and has been tested in the United States. But you remember a couple weeks ago when I said, I sure am glad we got stuff here like food recalls. They were recalling some um, uh, room spray, lavender room spray from Walmart. You remember? No, I don't. Huh. Okay, it's, I said it was just in the news. I said, "Wait, look, look, look at here. Here's a." Was here's that a, just a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, here's a food recall for uh, for listeria and powdered milk, and it. So that Walmart thing turned out to be really serious. There, they, there at that time there had been six deaths or four deaths or something, but this stuff had it as a bacteria in it. It's extremely rare. You, I'll bet there are hundreds of cases they've not diagnosed that people. 
in, just died and they thought they died, maybe they thought they died of COVID. But the point is, you shouldn't be taking stuff that's made in blinking China and bringing it into your home and taking it as a nutritional supplement or getting it in the air where people can inhale it because you just don't know what's in it. There. People always ask me, not all, not every, that's an overstatement. People ask me frequently about this line of questions. And I refer to, to them as nutraceuticals. Yes. Doc, is it okay for me? Is it okay for me to take this? And I have a standard response, and it's good for everyone to hear this response all at one time. Okay? Do you need it? Can you tell whether it's making you better or not? But most importantly, are you buying it from a source that's a f big enough that they're afraid of being sued? Yeah. Do you okay? know what's in it? Because it's not regulated. The, you know, it, it's it, that's what we call them nutraceuticals. It's quote in the pharmacy world. It's in that part of the market. But the FDA has written off any responsibility for this until it starts killing people. Yeah, they called it nutrition. Nut they call them, and that's why I say yeah. nutraceuticals, yeah. nutritional pseudocos. Okay, so you don't know. They could put be putting grass clippings in a capsule and telling you it grows hair. Okay? That's true. They could. They literally could. It's unregulated. They, they, so you yeah. need to know that whoever's putting it. It didn't work, did it? Did not, no, no, I've tried several. <laughs> but you need, to, you need to ask yourself the question is if that, is that whoever's putting those clippings in that capsule afraid it. of being right. sued? Because if there's some sort of little mom and pop things that's selling the wife of some doctor up in Blairsville, something you're vaping and smoking, and there's some tiny little person, and they'll put heavy metals in there. And tell you it's going to make you smarter. There are people out there that will kill you for money. Okay. Well, you can look so, at some of these TV ads on the cable channels at night, yeah. and it'll say retired chiropractor and doctor. It, yeah, and then, but it'll say retired chiropractor, and then it says some big. It's it's a it's a, a, a it's a juice plus light thing yeah. where it says I, it's got all these nutrients in a capsule. Well, you just think, if you think you could They wear the white coat. They come on and wear think, the white oh, coat. He's wearing a blue coat, this guy. Oh, okay. If you think you can take a bunch of, of, of broccoli and stuff and put it in a capsule and it's going to make you healthy and you can keep eating jelly donuts and you got, you, you, I've got a bridge in Arizona or, I mean a swamp in but Arizona. But there's a big business side. out there. There's a billion dollar industry out there selling this crap. Mm -hmm. Many billion dollars. Okay. Now, one of the other things I think is really important here is it, this got to the fourth item on the news. How does TV action hero Jack Reacher heal so fast? Well, my, my comment on that is I think we need to be diverted. And when you want to read a book for a man that will divert you, you go read Lee Child's Jack Reacher books. That makes like that guy in, in uh, 24 look like, a, look like a, uh, a priest or something. And I don't even care if he heals in 12 hours. You know, you got to be able to read some uh, and have some, some fiction. Have, have some fiction and enjoy it. So I, I, I'm not going to try and pick apart Jack Reacher healing it quickly. And uh, I'm going to let the I'm going to let us keep writing it. Or Lee Child keep writing it, and us keep reading it. So you know what we always say at this time on Fridays. What. You got to get to work. You got to yeah, find. Yeah, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, we're not finished. All right, yet. that's what All I'm right. saying. That's why I'm. That's almost like me saying, you know what time it is. Three point one. What is that? Three point one. I don't know. You do too. That's the <laughs> percentage of tests that are yes. positive. Right. COVID tests that right. are positive this week. It was 22 four weeks ago. Last week it was down to nine. I guess I, I can't help it. You got me confused with someone who below, cares. It'll be below five, right? Now I thought it was since, what you wanted my PSA to be. But since okay. since the <laughs> since the epidemic began, the percentage of total tests, percentage of positivity tests for the entire what now 24 months or longer mm -hmm. has been 12.6 percent. Right. Okay, now there has been one more death in Fannin County. We're at 141. All right. But the weekly average is still zero, and the weekly average of cases is down to three. And a couple of weeks ago, it was 14. So, masks are off, sunshine's out there, and not off in some schools, I hate to say. But anyway, masks. Go, go about your life. Masks are off, sunshine's out there. 
Uh, it's chilly in the morning and warm in the afternoon. It's going to be good weather all weekend in Blue Ridge. And please donate blood. There. I'm down from one or two calls a day about possible COVID to almost to, to maybe one a week. Wow. Wait, wait, gone. Uh, I want to put this out just as a philosophical question for our audience to ponder. We, started, we were talking in the green room about this. Um, if I had a, a mom bring a child to me and say, my child doesn't well, like being around other people, they avoid folks. Child, mom comes in, yeah. my, my child is not a, around other people. Yeah. We'll, we'll separate themselves He's from other people. Uncomfortable right. being around other people. Okay. Your child's naturally social distancing. Okay. Natural. Well, I'm going to be working up that child for Alzheimer's or Asperger's syndrome. Okay. Autism. Autism. Autism, right. Autism. Um, now, if the head of some large three-letter agency comes out and starts therapeutically saying we all need to avoid each other and not want to be around each other and to therapeutically social distance, in the future, I'd like us to ask that man a question. Are you crazy? All right, that's it. That's all I want to ponder say. on that. He wants okay. you to ponder on yeah. it. I like a, I like a good ponder. We'll ponder on that. And don't like blood. And I'll start this afternoon. We thank Georgia Cancer Specialists affiliated with Northside Hospital Cancer Institute. We appreciate it for the questions. I've enjoyed this segment. I really have. Glad to have both of you together. This has been a lot of fun today. Well, I was glad you could be on my program today. <laughs> you and your tie. Oh, you got you got me worked up there, but. That's okay, because he has to get to work. We have no idea where he's going, but we're going to commercial, and they're waiting for the all-star panel. There you go.